But I guess, you know, this, this example of the MV Portland really demonstrates um, uh, that under capitalism, you know, profits prevail over all else. And I think, as Aaron mentioned in his talk, the idea that profits are more important than the lives of workers. And, you know, I think we understand from these sorts of disputes that the ruling class or the corporate class or however you like to talk about them, the corporate, corporate interests will use whatever means they have at their disposal to uh, guarantee those profits ahead of anyone else's interests, particularly the interests of workers, the community and the environment. They'll use anti-union laws, they'll use the courts, they'll even go so far as to deregister a union um, that rears its head. They'll criminalise union um, activity, union organising. And I think a lot of us have witnessed um, certainly the shenanigans, the pantomime, whatever you want to call it, of the Trade Union Royal Commission over the last um, year or so uh, in chasing down and pursuing relentlessly union organisers for simply doing their job. But I think a couple of recent decisions really show, you know, the kangaroo court nature of the Trade Union Royal Commission. And two decisions that came down within the last week um, uh, are interesting just to make note of. One was Joe McDonald, CFMEU leader from WA, was found not guilty in the Perth Magistrates Court. Um, and these were charges that arose out of his activities as a union leader. He was charged with trespassing for basically organising a barbecue um, for workers on the QE2 hospital site in Perth during their smoko break, um, got charged with trespassing and was vilified in the Murdoch press um, as a union thug and all the rest of it. When it actually, when the bosses had to actually provide the evidence in court, they were unable to actually demonstrate a case and so he was found not guilty. The other recent decision uh, was that of the police raids on the ACT office of the CFMEU, the, the um, um, by the Australian Federal Police. And this was in connection with the actions um, that got a lot of time um, at the Trade Union Royal Commission for John Lomax, who was a union organiser in the ACT, um, for simply doing his job to fight for the rights of his members um, to a decent pay, decent conditions on building sites. He was basically, his activity was criminalised. They tried to, they tried to basically paint him as a criminal and again, they had no evidence to actually back that up and it didn't stand up in the court. But it's pretty obvious, I mean, you know, they are wins, certainly, but I think that, you know, we all understand here that the, the, the government and the Australian employers, employer class, the ruling class, needs the Trade Union Royal Commission to really further weaken and undermine the strength of unions tying them up in costly legal battles, you know, and making it easier for employers to prosecute their neoliberal agenda of attacking wages and conditions, of bringing in privatisation, of offshoring of jobs um, to where labour's cheaper, and of course cutting our services. And, you know, when you look at it right now, the, you know, the union movement is in a difficult situation. I mean, the latest figures on union membership um, show another drop in union membership um, to 15% of the workforce. Of course, it's a lot higher in the public sector than it is in the private sector. But generally, you know, this, this is a sign of a crisis that, um, that the union movement is under. And there are a lot of factors that have led to this situation. Anti-union laws that we've all been fighting, not just since Howard got in, but even in back in the 70s when um, secondary boycott legislation that outlawed solidarity strikes was brought in under the Fraser government. Um, but also structural changes that the Australian economy has undergone, you know, where um, uh, manufacturing's moved offshore, there's been a growth in the services sector, um, as well have, have played a large part in the, the drop in union membership. But I think also the responsibility has to rest on the legacy of the period in Australian industrial history, which is we call the Accord years during the 1980s, where sections of the union movement basically agreed to rein in their demands for wages, wage rises um, in the interests of maintaining Australian competitiveness in a world market. Um, and we're still really paying for this now um, through the undermining of union power. 
So we have a situation where underemployment, unpaid overtime, 12-hour shifts, you know, no penalty rates, no sick leave, no annual leave are set to become the norm and already are the norm for a lot of workers in Australia. Long service leave, you know, a lot of workers don't get access to that and those who do, you know, are finding that it's under threat all the time. Shift allowances, workplace health, workplace health and safety, um, compensation, uh, superannuation contributions um, are all under threat. Um, industry super um, in particular. And the idea that, you know, flexible working hours so you can pick up the kids and drop them off and all that sort of thing uh, are also becoming more and more out of reach of the average worker. And well unionised industries like the maritime, mining and uh, mineral sectors have suffered a lot of job losses um, as a result of changes in technology, um, but also commodity prices, etc. The textile industry um, and as I mentioned before, offshoring of jobs. And the mining boom has, you know, brought with it the social crisis that accompanies the fly-in, fly-out um, sector for workers. Um, you know, where you workers fly into a mining area, work for 12-hour shifts, weeks at a time, sometimes two to three weeks at a time without a day off. No weekends, no shift penalties, and then they fly home for a, two or three weeks and try to have a family life, try to pick up where they left off with their partner, with the kids and so on. And, you know, while some of those workers get very generous pay packets, you have to wonder, how, you know, is it really worth it compared to the level of suffering and social consequences that are endured um, by those workers, their families and the communities that they fly in and out of. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's all, you know, it's, there's a whole story associated with the introduction of fly in, fly out. Um, but really, you know, what it's meant is an undermining of a strong sense of worker solidarity, um, which has been a hallmark, particularly in the mining industry um, and communities in which those miners work. Now, you know, that we've got the growth in, in service sector, um, targeting by multinational companies using labour hire um, in cleaning, for example, um, which is all about shifting the risk from employers onto employees. And workers who are on contracts have to cover their own entitlements to annual and sick leave, superannuation, workers' compensation. Whereas if they're employed you know, on an award as a proper employee, which many of them really should be, um, most of them really should be, they would have enjoyed those conditions under their awards. And now we've got a situation where some 40% of workers are now in so-called precarious work, casual or fixed term um, contracts. We've got casualisation in the higher education centre, sector, which I think still shocks a lot of people. I mean, this is, this is the area where I've been an active unionist, um, that now, you know, as a student, 50% or more of undergraduate teaching is now done by casuals. And I'm sure, you know, any students in this room can understand how, you know, why it's so hard to get a hold of your tutor or your lecturer in between class, um, because they don't have an office. They just come and deliver the classes and then they, then they have to work at home. Um, and, and so on. So this is the, this is the sort of situation um, that academic workers are in now. <coughs> and then we've got the Productivity Commission, you know, putting the pressure on to cut Sunday penalty rates for hospitality workers or workers in the retail industries. I mean, this is going to have a big impact on students in particular. You know, this can mean wage cuts of 17, 17 to 38 per cent for workers that are already on low wages um, and in insecure employment. And, you know, the truth is that under neoliberalism um, and with the undermining of strength in the union movement, now, you know, wages growth is at the slowest that it's been for 17 years in Australia. Um, and now we're, what we're seeing is a shift in wealth, the wealth that we all as workers actually create through our labour, a shift in that wealth going from wages, that is us getting compensated for that, to the profit sector. And it's now at levels um, that match around about the 1960s in Australia. And of course the free trade agreements that the Australian government and employers are now negotiating are just seeking to generalise these sorts of conditions that I've mentioned across, um, across our class. Um, and the problem is that, you know, we have a, uh, a so-called Labor Party um, that is actually not providing any real opposition to the sorts of attacks going on against workers', workers rights. 
And I think part of the problem is too that, you know, our trade union leaderships put a lot of their eggs in the basket of just re-electing a Labor government and thinking that that's going to solve the problem. But it's quite clear that that strategy has not worked up until now. Um, for example, when the Rudd government was elected after those years, hard years of fighting Howard's work choices agenda, they didn't roll back all of the attacks under work choices. They kept a lot of it intact. They kept a lot of the Australian Building Construction Commission intact and a lot of the other work choices style um, laws intact, which just made it much easier when Abbott got elected for him to try to reintroduce the sharper points, the sharper elements of um, the Building and Construction Commission. And it was really only, you know, as a result of the, the amazing mobilisations around the budget um, through the March in March movement that that was actually being able to be held off because it put a lot of political pressure on the opposition parties and the crossbench to um, argue against um, those things being passed. And a lot of those legislations, thankfully, are still sitting in limbo in the Senate. Although one, I have to mention, because just thinking about it when Mia was giving her talk, is that just in the last couple of days, the ALP just voted with the government to scrap the startup scholarships um, for students and replace them with a loan. Um, so another betrayal by the ALP um, of students. So we clearly have a need to rebuild our unions, not just to protect our industrial rights, but also to be fighting organisations for our class um, against you know, the myriad of neoliberal attacks that we're um, faced with but also against the attempts by the bosses to divide workers. And I think Aaron talked about this in his presentation about you know, the rise of racism, Islamophobia, um, homophobia. You know, unions have a role to play in actually fighting the employer's agenda of playing divide and rule with workers. And they need to show political leadership on these questions, not just industrial leadership. I mean, while you know, the situation for people in Australia is far from say the situation in Greece today or Spain um, post the global financial crisis. But you know, if you're a casual, if you're a single parent or on a disability pension, if you're a student, um, if, you're, if you're Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or living with a disability, it's certainly more apparent. Um, decades you know, of um, neoliberal attacks um, has impacted on the most vulnerable in our society and has also rolled back a lot of the gains that were made thanks to the movements of the 60s and 70s that introduced a lot of reforms that did actually improve people's lives. And so now we have a situation where for women, the gender pay gap has gone backwards um, in the last decade. Um, you know, this is an insane situation in a rich country like Australia that we have um, the gender pay gap actually widening. So for women in particular, I just want to talk, talk about the situation for women. I mean, in New South Wales now, the Baird government um, has you know, taken uh, steps to close down refuges, women's refuges, or to mainstream specialist feminist services for women, escaping gender and family violence, um, into general homelessness services or emergency accommodation services. And New South Wales was a real pioneer um, and the feminist movement, particularly in New South Wales, was a real pioneer in the setting up of the refuge movement. Um, but you see services, long-standing services like Elsie's, one of the oldest feminist-based um, refuges in the country that had to close its doors over the last 12 months because of these changes. We've seen attacks on abortion rights, um, the, the attempts to introduce so-called fetal parenthood, sorry, fetal personhood laws in New South Wales thanks to the likes of Fred Nile. Um, Nile, a few weeks ago, signalled that he was going to try and put this another bill. It's almost on the anniversary each year. He has to have another go. Um, but thankfully, it doesn't seem that anything's come of that this time. Fortunately, the New South Wales Greens uh, MP, Maureen Faruqi, has indicated that she is prepared to move a bill to uh, decriminalise abortion in New South Wales. Um, and there's discussion now going on in Queensland about relaunching a pro-choice campaign um, up there, uh, uh, particularly in far north Queensland, but I think it'll become a statewide campaign if it takes off, um, to actually repeal finally the sections of Queensland's criminal code um, now that they actually have a government where they might actually get the numbers to do it in the parliament. Um, it's always, although, you know, it's funny because even in spite of that Labor 
MPs are arguing, oh, it's not time, it's not time, we can't do it now, we can't rock the boat, um, which, you know, haven't we heard that before? I mean, a woman's, you know, right to control her fertility is fundamental. And you just have to look at what's going on in the United States today to see what happens when um, the right to abortion starts to be rolled back. In Texas now, you know, through the crackdown that's been going on there, the rise in backyard abortions um, and women putting their lives and their health at risk through backyard abortion has now risen again. Um, and many women thought that those days were well behind us. The shootings at Planned Parenthood, I mean, these are all connected with the right-wing backlash against a woman's right to control her reproduction. And then we have, you know, campaigns or the issue of violence against women. But, you know, all we seem to get in response is a lot of victim blaming or a sort of law and order response to the issue of violence against women. But yet there's such a need to address attitudes, particularly amongst young men towards women, prevention campaigns, but importantly, the questions of economic independence or economic dependency that many women suffer that leads them or forces them to stay in abusive relationships and the lack of social support services out there. You know, it's just so hypocritical to see someone like Baird campaigning around White Ribbon Day, but at the same time happy to close women's refuges, um, the lifeline that so many women need um, to actually get out of abusive relationships. But then we also, you know, in talking about um, anti-violence campaigns, we've got to address the other hypocrisy, which is of a government campaigning against violence while at the same time torturing women, children and men who are fleeing war and persecution for our shores, for safety, in offshore detention prisons, in onshore detention prisons. You know, the, the violence that that represents um, is, you know, is so shameful. Or preventing women, you know, who've suffered sexual assault and rape from getting access to abortion services in Australia or women to safe childbirth access. I mean, ultimately, you know, we've got to close those detention centres down and do away with the mandatory detention system. That's, that's the only way to solve it. But, you know, it, it's, it's an absolute hypocrisy, an absolute shame that our politicians get away with appearing to look so progressive in relation to the question of violence against women, while at the same time they are prosecuting, perpetuating that violent action towards refugees or the violence towards Aboriginal women um, being carried out by DOCS, the Department of Community Services, in taking away newborn babies. This is happening in Sydney, Metropolitan Sydney Hospitals, right now. Um, women are giving birth and having their newborn babies taken away from them and they're deemed to be unfit mothers because they're Aboriginal without access to the support services that they need. Anyway, well, I just want to finish by saying to defend, you know, our rights as workers, we've got to flex our muscle. Um, flex that muscle means flexing the muscle, the right that we have to withdraw our labour. Um, after all, you know, it's our labour that actually generates the wealth in this society and, make, and gets the work done. But I think, you know, workers need their allies. Um, but also I think as women too, you know, in defending our rights, um, we've got to organise as women, but we've also got to seek our alliances too and build the coalitions we need to actually defend our rights but to also further them. And we certainly can't allow our campaigns as women to wait um, or sit back and allow, um, allow you know, uh, and not take a lead um, in, in that um, campaign. Um, and what we have to do ultimately is to realise the power of our class. After all, we're the majority of society and those that control the wealth are the minority. And we've got to build the movement against the power of the corporations, against this system that strives, that survives on class exploitation, on oppression and on destruction of our environment and to take the power back from the corporations and start to build the kind of world that we want to live in. So I'll leave it there. Thanks.